The next case delves into one of the most opaque sections of the Uniform Commercial Code. In his pun-filled opinion in Textile Unlimited versus ABMH, Judge Thomas of the Ninth Circuit had to grapple with the battle of the forms in which two companies send each other form documents with incompatible terms and conditions. Uh, <coughs> the case involved Textile Unlimited, a yarn distributor in California, and ABMH, a yarn manufacturer in Georgia. The two companies regularly did business with Textile buying yarn from ABMH 38 times. You can see some of Textile's yarn here. Each time Textile sent a purchase order to ABMH via a broker, and then ABMH would send an invoice and a, an order acknowledgement that contained an arbitration clause stating that any dispute would have to be arbitrated back in Atlanta. On the 39th order, Textile received what it claimed was defective yarn, and so it refused to pay. ABMH set up an arbitration in Atlanta, but Textile sued in federal court in California to prevent ar the arbitration from going forward. We're looking at the opinion from the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, the federal appeals court that covers California and other western states. Judge Thomas must decide whether the arbitration clause is enforceable, even if Textile Unlimited never explicitly agreed to it. <clears throat> Let's walk through the key sections of the Uniform Commercial Code, uh, Section 2207, to see how Judge Thomas reaches his conclusion that the arbitration clause is not enforceable because it's not part of the contract between the two parties. Subsection 1 deals with the basic question of whether there's a contract in the, these battle of the form contexts where two companies are sending back and forth forms with conflicting terms. When confronting a 2207 question, it's important to separately address different routes to whether a contract is formed and separately what are the terms of a contract if it is formed. 2207 lays out different ways of forming a contract and different ways can produce different terms. Section 1 first tells us that an expression of acceptance can operate as an acceptance even if that expression states terms that are additional to or different from those that are offered. That by itself tells us that the UCC rejects the common law's mirror image rule. In the Minneapolis and St. Louis Railway case, when the offeree made an expression of acceptance that stated different terms, the expression was considered a counteroffer, not an acceptance. But 22071 tells us that non-matching acceptances can operate, they do operate as acceptances, and therefore can form contracts. Second, subsection 1 says that a written confirmation of an earlier oral agreement can also operate as an acceptance, even if the confirmation states different terms. So, if a buyer and seller agree orally to a big order on the telephone, and then one sends a written confirmation in part to satisfy the statute of frauds, the confirmation can operate as an acceptance, even if this confirmation includes different or additional terms. But subsection one also includes the, uh, the famous unless clause, which tells us that the two ways of creating a contract the non-matching acceptance route and the non-matching confirmation route, that these two routes are not effective if acceptance is expressly made conditional on assent to additional or different terms. The unless question boils down to whether the offeree's form says that the acceptance is conditional on the offeror's accepting 
the, uh, the new or additional terms. If that's the case, then the writing does not operate as an acceptance, but operates merely as a counteroffer. In this case, ABMH, the offeree, <coughs> uh, had a form that is quite explicit. Seller's willingness to sell yarn to you is conditioned on your acceptance of these terms of sale. So, ABMH's form expressly triggers the unless clause. There is therefore no contract based on 22071. It's interesting to note that in this context, Textile Unlimited's receipt of the yarn wasn't an acceptance of new terms. As Judge Thomas notes, we don't want a rule where whoever sends the last form wins. So if subsection 1 tells us that a contract has been entered into based on the forms, subsection 2 tells us what the actual contents of the contract are if it is formed under subsection 1. It doesn't apply in this case because there was no subsection 1 formation but it's worth familiarizing yourself with what the terms would be uh, under subsection 2. The first sentence of subsection 2 tells us that additional terms are to be construed as proposals for additions to the contract. Remember, the contract was formed with non-matching terms, but according to the first sentence of subsection 2, those new terms are not included in the contract, but are an offer to modify uh, if the other side agrees to this modification proposal. The second sentence, however, lays out a different treatment of contracts formed under subsection 1 that are between two merchants. By default, the new terms uh, on the offeree's form become part of the contract if the formation is between two merchants, except uh, uh, under three listed uh, conditions. Number one, the offer expressly limits acceptance to the terms of the offer. Number two, if the additional terms materially change the agreement. And number three, if the other side uh, objects. In this case, if there had been a contract formed under subsection one, the arbitration clause would probably have been valid because the parties are merchants and textile Textile's offer didn't expressly limit acceptance to its terms of the offer, and crucially, the court probably would find that the additional arbitration term isn't a material alteration. And finally, Textile Unlimited never objected to this arbitration clause. Many times, the question of whether non-matching terms between merchants come into the contract is going to be governed by the Shakespearean question, to be or not to be, did the terms materially alter the agreement? Subsection 3 of 2207 tells us what happens if there's no formation under subsection 1, but the party's conduct, based on what they do, evidences that they uh, believed they were in a contract. If the parties act as if there's a contract by shipping and accepting the goods. Uh, so there can still be a contract based on their conduct. And secondly, it tells us what terms to apply when we're going to have formation via party conduct. And that's, those terms are going to be governed by what's called the knockout doctrine. So under the knockout doctrine, we remove any terms on which the two companies' forms do not agree and then supplement what, what's left over with the default rules from the UCC. As applied to this case, the arbitration agreement is not in both forms, and so it would be knocked out. We strike it out. It isn't part of the contract, and, and so the court will not enforce it. Uh, subsection 3 provides both a third route to non-matching formation and a knockout rule for determining what terms will be in the contract. Subsection 3 is important because in a classic battle of the forms, there will not be subsection 1 formation because the forms will always demand additional assent, so the unless clause will be triggered. 
the drafters of 2207 hoped that the knockout rule would put a thumb on the scale in favor of the UCC defaults. Under the common law's mirror image rule, the last form tended to win the battle of the forms. You see, under the mirror image rule, each writing exchanged between the buyer and the seller failed to form a, a contract because it was not a mirror image. Each writing was therefore just a counteroffer. The seller forms would often restrict warranties, and the buyer's forms would not restrict the warranties. Each non-matching form would merely be a counteroffer. The seller would normally then win the battle of the forms because the seller would send the last form with its shipment, and the buyer would be deemed to accept this last form, this last counteroffer, by taking physical possession of the goods. So under the common law and the mirror image rule, the seller's form restricting warranties would normally govern uh, the terms of the contract. But subsection 3 sought to fix that by saying that when the conduct of the parties evidence the formation of a contract, that, the, that conflicting terms drop out and the default warranties uh, and other terms would govern uh, whenever there was a disagreement. So, imagine this uh, hypothetical. ABC sends an order to XYZ to buy 100 widgets. XYZ sends an invoice and then the goods. The invoice contains a provision saying uh, only, quote, there will be no punitive damages based on this sale. ABC does not say anything about the punitive damages provision. The widgets turn out to be defective and ABC sues are they bound by the punitive damages provision? Well, the answer is probably yes. In this situation, the term concerning uh, uh, the punitive damages is incorporated probably into the contract. First, we see that under subsection 1, there is a contract because the non-matching invoice operates as an acceptance and XYZ's form doesn't condition its acceptance on ABC's assent to additional terms. So we have subsection 1 formation. We then look to subsection 2 to find out what the terms of this formed contract are. So under subsection 2, it says that the contracts between merchants, which we have here, the new terms become binding unless one of the three conditions apply. Well, ABC didn't object. And a, and a court likely wouldn't find a material, material alteration in this prohibition on punitive damages since we'll learn later on in the course, or actually in contracts too, that punitive damages usually aren't allowed in, in contract cases. So the new condition is likely to be found to be binding. But the big fight, again, will be to be or not to be whether the provision was a material alteration. There are three main takeaways from uh, this battle of forms discussion. The first is that in transactions between merchants, new terms on the offeree's form generally do become part of the contract unless the offeror objects or they, these new terms mater materially alter the agreement. And when the two parties don't ever come to agreement based on the forms, courts apply under subsection 3 of 2207, the knockout doctrine. So the actual contract is any terms that appear on both forms together with the default rules from the UCC. And finally, when analyzing 2207 separately, uh, it's important that you separately analyze what terms govern from the question of whether a contract is formed by one of the three routes, the non-matching acceptance route, the non-matching confirmation route, and the conduct of the parties route.